usually takes place on the second Tuesday of the month, but sometimes, as in today, not so much. Oh, was that a clap? That was exciting. Um, one take is, thank you. One take is supported in part by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. Tonight's film is Requiem for the American Dream. I hope that's what you're all here for. Directed by Peter Hutchinson, Kelly Nikas, and Jared P. Scott. So I'll just say a few words and keep it rather brief because we definitely want to have time after the film. Uh, luckily for us, these three filmmakers captured an essential, sobering, and very timely teaching from Professor Noam Chomsky on the principles of concentration of wealth and power. Filmed over four years, Professor Chomsky clearly shares his insight as to how the American dream has unraveled over time. Professor Chomsky's interviews are highlighted by some beautifully shot visuals and clever animation and edited in a rhythmic way that is almost musical in nature, in the most profound way. This film leaves us with much to ponder and to continue to analyze long after viewing it. Um, I will tell you, this is, will be the first viewing by Professor Chomsky himself as well, so you all get to share that experience. <laughs> Um, following this screening, Professor William Fitzpatrick of the University of Rochester will take over. He'll introduce our panel, which includes the three filmmakers, Professor Chomsky, and it will be moderated by Professor Stuart, Stuart Weaver, I'm sorry, also of the University of Rochester. I'm sure all of your cell phones are turned off by now because we have such an incredibly enlightened audience here at the Little Theater. Uh, and now I'd like to invite Peter, Kelly, and Jared up to say a few words before we start to roll the film. Hey, how's it going? I'm Jared. This is uh, Peter. This is Kelly. Thanks so much for, uh, for coming out. And yeah, I think as Linda said, uh, we're, we're thrilled to be able to, to watch the film with Professor Chomsky for the first time um, in Valeria. This is uh, exciting for us. We probably won't stay in and watch it, but uh, at some point, I think also Professor Chomsky might storm out. It's not because he doesn't like it. He just might have to use the restroom. So we'll see. No. <laughs> Uh, we would like to thank everyone who played a part in bringing this evening together. It's, as Jared said, it's very special for us, very special for us to watch the film with uh, Professor Chomsky for the first time together. Um, we'd like to thank the Little Theater. Uh, we'd like to thank University of Rochester. We'd like to thank WXXI. Um, and as a former resident of Rochester, it's really exciting for me to be here in, you know, in the Little, where I've seen so many wonderful th films before. So. Thanks for being here. And last but not least, <clears throat> we would like to thank Professor Chomsky for giving us the opportunity to have what I would easily say has been one of the creative high points of filmmaking that we've shared collectively. It's been an extraordinary experience. And I'd like to thank all of you because it's Friday night and it's beautiful weather and it's 7.30 and you could be absolutely anywhere. But you're here. You're engaged, you have questions, and we look forward to having a robust discussion with you afterwards. So thank you for helping make this film, which should not have happened. If somebody three years ago had given us $20 and a six pack for the hard drives, I'm quite confident that we would have accepted it gladly. But we persevered, we worked hard. It was a really, really difficult film for us to make because the information is so thoughtful and so dense and deep but we're overjoyed that, it, that we were able to finish it and to see audiences like this is moving in a way that is hard for me to articulate. So thank you to all of you and we look forward to having the discussion after the screening. And thanks to my dad. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Fitzpatrick from the Department of Philosophy uh, at the University of Rochester. And uh, thank you very much for coming. What a fantastic film and what a privilege to be able to sit and watch it with Noam Chomsky uh, for the first time. And yeah. and, and with the filmmakers, Peter, Kelly, and Jared. Um, thank you all so much for making this film.
To me, this is just an incredibly refreshing dose of moral clarity. And in the last hour, I've actually just revised my moral philosophy syllabus. Um, we'll have to talk about that, how I can do that legally. Um, it's fantastic. So I just want to take a couple minutes before we start to tell you a little bit about uh, how this event came to be. So as you may know, uh, Professor Chomsky is here as the University of Rochester's Distinguished Visiting Humanist. This is an exciting program that's now under the umbrella of the New Humanities Center at the University of Rochester. If you don't know about that, I would encourage you to go online, just Google Humanities Center Rochester and, and you'll get it. Um, and this is a program that uh, brings uh, are the very most prominent scholars working on broadly humanistic questions to campus to, uh, for a variety of talks and meetings with student groups, faculty groups, and members of the Rochester uh, community. Uh, the president told us when, you know, when selecting people for this, shoot for the stars, so we did, and to say that we got one I think would be quite an understatement. Um, so he's here for that, and I have to say, yeah, I have to say, we've been working Professor Chomsky pretty hard these past three days. Uh, this is our final event. Uh, and you know, from the beginning, we had scheduled the big talk yesterday, another film, uh, Michel Gondry's film, is The Man Who Is Tall Happy. That was Wednesday night on campus. A variety of meetings with students and faculty. Um, but it was thanks in particular to Tanya uh, Bakhmetyeva that we added this event to our program. So I'd like to thank Tanya. Uh, she was the one who contacted the filmmakers, thought this would be a great idea. And I also want to th thank Bree Merkel from the Little Theater who contacted us um, with the suggestion of partnering with the university to screen the film here at our favorite community theater. So uh, that was a wonderful idea too. Um, so here we are, right, ready to have a conversation with Noam Chomsky and the filmmakers about their film, Requiem for the American Dream, and uh, about the problem of inequality. So now I'd like to introduce my colleague at the University of Rochester in the Department of History, uh, Professor Stuart Weaver, who will um, handle the Q&A. Yeah, moderate. Thank you. I'm going to borrow this from Professor Chomsky for only one brief moment, um, I promise. Um, thank you, Bill, and thank you all for staying here for the q and A. I I didn't see anyone bolt for the doors, so perhaps there was no risk of that. Uh, but thank you all for staying. Uh, my modest role as moderator is first just to articulate a few ground rules um, and uh, explain how this will go. We're going to have a microphone um, which uh, Sia and Celeste will monitor on, uh, in either aisle here. Is that right, Bree? And so we're going to ask you to form a queue a line in American English uh, in each aisle here and um, please keep your questions as succinct as you can. We have a limited amount of time. I apologize in advance for those whom I won't be able to recognize should we run out of time. Um, so I'll also be succinct now and just say please keep your questions succinct and limit yourself to one question only and um, not succumb to the temptation of a follow-up question. And um, as you can see, we have the three film directors, Jared and Peter and Kelly, with us. And uh, we encourage you to direct questions to Professor Chomsky, of course, or to the three directors of the film that we've just seen. Um, so those are the ground rules. Um, and so as our lines form, perhaps I'll just start things out myself a little bit, because we were all struck, Professor Chomsky, that you had not seen this film before and that we were seeing it with you as you were seeing it for the first time. So perhaps. Um, I'll just start, while people come to the microphones, if they're going to do that, I'll just start by asking, how'd you like it? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the, uh, yeah, I liked it a lot, but the best compliment to the uh, directors and producers was actually given to me as I was walking up by the young man who was sitting next to me. He said that uh, he was struck by the fact that uh, the things I said were very concise, and he pointed out correctly that uh, I'm always accused of lacking uh, a property called concision. Uh, <laughs> in fact, that goes it's very far reaching. My, my kids, uh, when they asked questions when they were little, uh, they would sometimes say, please, only the five minute lecture. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but this was very concise, so congratulations. <laughs> 
All right, shall we begin stage right? Sia, do we have a microphone down here? And a first question for either the directors or Professor Chomsky. Uh, yes, um, beautiful film, uh, Professor Chomsky. Um, I've read a long investigative journalism piece <coughs> on the speculation on Wall Street and how it was self-regulated. Could you clarify that a bit more, what that looks like? The regulation of Wall Street by, say, uh, false by? Uh, false, regulation. False, regulation. false regulation. Well, there are, uh, I mean, there are regulatory measures, and uh, uh, you know, the, uh, t they have some impact. In fact, uh, as was mentioned during the film and the period when the, oh sorry, that's my other failure, I never remember where to put the microphone. Uh, there are regulatory measures that can be effective. Uh, uh, it was mentioned in the film that the New Deal regulations, which were in force through the 50s and the 60s into the early 70s, uh, they in fact prevented any financial crises. Uh, as the deregulatory dereg apparatus began to decline, uh, in part under business pressure, in part uh, under economic theories that said they're no good and so on, uh, you had the, an increase in, uh, in uh, crises. Uh, th there has been an effort to uh, restore some form of uh, regulatory measures, Dodd-Frank. Uh, the uh, business world has lobbied very hard to uh, create exceptions, that, um, so complex derivatives, for example. Uh, much of the shadow banking system has been kind of exempted from regulation by lobbyist pressure. And there's going to be constant pressure, we can be certain of it, from systems of power to prevent any constraint on their expanding their power and the profit. And the only counterforce is you, to the extent that the public fights back uh, effective systems can be created, uh, not only to regulate uh, the big banks, but uh, uh, towards the end there was a question, a comment about how any system of hierarchy and domination uh, has to uh, demonstrate its legitimacy, and if they can't, should be dismantled. And that uh, challenge should be imposed to the institutions of the financial system uh, very broadly. That's another task for an organized, committed, uh, dedicated population. Not just to regulate them, to, but to ask why they're there. Thank you. We're going to take turns side to side, so over to the left, Celeste. Um, I just have a comment, actually. I'm going to say very brief. Um, but I'm Pakistani-American, I'm an intervention filmmaker, and in 2009, I shot a film in Lahore, in Pakistan, which was a broad survey of public opinion uh, about issues that are of interest to Americans. So I asked a wide spectrum of Pakistanis about what they thought uh, about the Taliban, about the war on terror, about American foreign policy in the region, about drone attacks, and um, most of the people I talked to were actually very astute as far as politics and knew a lot about not just Pakistani politics but also American politics. And they talked at length about how uh, the media is very corporate in America and so the American public is very brainwashed. But then many of them mentioned you by name and said, but then there's also people like Noam Chomsky. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to share that with you that you, as an individual, are an antidote to American imperialism and aggression. <laughs> 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 no, I should have added, but the, the general point that you make, I think, is worth uh, amplifying a little. Uh, global opinion is of great significance, and one of the techniques of manufacturing consent is not to report it, uh, literally. So for example, there are 
regular polls of international opinion on all sorts of issues, uh, not taken by obscure organizations. They're taken, for example, by the Gallup, uh, the international affiliate of the Gallup polling organization, the main US polling organization. Uh, one of the questions they ask is, which country is the greatest threat to world peace? Uh, by an overwhelming margin, the United States wins. Uh, second is Pakistan, uh, way down below, and that's inflated by the Indian vote, of course. Uh, and uh, the countries that we call the gravest threat to world peace, like Iran, are barely mentioned. Well, how many of you read this in the newspaper? Uh, basically zero. It wasn't reported. I think there may have been one report some in some tabloid in the United States which uh, said, uh, look how crazy the world is or something like that. <laughs> but it's just not reported. Uh, a couple of weeks ago there was a poll uh, taken among young people in uh, Iraq, uh, Yemen, a couple other countries, I forget which, maybe Pakistan. It turned out about 90% hate the United States. Uh, why? Well, there are reasons for it. Uh, do Americans know about this? Very little. I mean, it's not that the uh, editorial boards of the newspapers can't read the Gallup polls. Yeah, they can. It's just this is not the kind of information that would be good for people like us to know. Uh, you can find it with great effort. You know, it's, not, it's an open, free society. Nobody's, uh, they're not going to kill you for saying it. Uh, or for repeating it, but uh, it's not known to the general public. And it's important. We should ask ourselves, we should be concerned about the fact that 90% uh, of young people in the countries we theoretically liberated hate the United States. Uh, where do you think ISIS comes from? Uh, we should ask why uh, overwhelmingly the population of the world regards the United States is the gravest threat to world peace. I mean, are they crazy? Is there a reason? Is that something we do? Uh, well, you know, those are things that people like us should be concerned about. And I think you're right to bring up the question of what public opinion is in Lahore. I'm sure it's not very different from this. <laughs> Thank you. That was an object lesson in how you take a compliment and turn it into an opportunity for thoughtful commentary. <laughs> Hi, Professor. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity, and um, I'm really grateful for the experience. Thanks for coming. Um, my question is in regards to um, technology. Um, with low skilled and uh, high skilled labor being outsourced um, towards machines, uh, do you believe this will result in a, a positive or negative um, relation towards um, income equality? Um, in the future, and do you think actually I'll leave with that? Um, uh, with technology um, replacing people in the workforce, uh, do you believe this will lead towards um, um, the wealth gap lessening, or like which where do you see the trajectory of this going? So would the rise of technology? jeopardize jobs and so on. Is that, is that the question? Or lessen, lessen, lessen income inequality. Does lessen income inequality. Well, well, actually, uh, you know, technology is kind of neutral. Depends how it's used. Uh, the, there's a lot of talk about uh, robotization and so on, eliminating jobs. Now, there's no sign of that. Absolutely no sign of it. Uh, in fact, there's, uh, if you just take a look around the country, uh, any city you look at, any place, there's a huge amount of work to be done. I mean, infrastructure's collapsing, uh, the educational system doesn't have enough teachers, uh, you know, uh, people can't find uh, medical aid. I mean, everywhere you look, there are huge numbers of problems. Uh, there are huge problems of, la of work that has to be done, that ought to be done to improve the society. There's plenty of people who want to do the work. In fact, uh, uh, labor partic the, the participation of the labor force in actual, uh, potential labor force in actual labor is quite low. Uh, so plenty of people want to do work, a lot of work to be done, plenty of resources, 
as was mentioned in the film, uh, corporate profits are going through the roof. So here we have a society with massive amounts of work to be done, plenty of, eye, of hands that want to do it, uh, resources for it. The system can't put them together. Uh, technology is not the answer to that. Uh, robotiza robotization, which is sometimes described as a great threat, is that could actually be a wonderful liberating force. Uh, robotization would uh, at most uh, eliminate the kinds of work that people really don't want to do. Dangerous work, uh, routine work, boring work, uh, the kind of work which uh, destroys the mind and so on. Actually the kind of work uh, which uh, Adam Smith denounced, to mention the guy who came up there a couple of times. Uh, Adam Smith is uh, famous, you've all studied the first paragraph of Wealth of Nations about uh, you know the butcher and the baker and everybody works together and division of labor is wonderful. Uh, but not many people have gotten to page whatever it is, uh, 450, where there's a, where he sharply condemns division of labor because he says it turns people into creatures as stupid and ignorant as a human being can be because they're going to be driven to performing routine, stupid tasks and not developing and exercising their intelligence and creative capacity. So therefore, in every civilized society, uh, the government would have to intervene to prevent this from happening. Well, uh, one way of preventing it from happening would be to take the routine, boring, uh, mind-destroying work and let robots do it. That could be liberating, frees people to do creative work. It's not going to be used that way unless the population forces it. It could very well be used just to uh, undermine what limited opportunities for work there are. But those are choices. There's nothing in the technology that decides how it's going to, how it should be used. Can I jump in with a follow-on? Please, yes. <clears throat> you spoke to, and this was one of the things that we spoke to when we interviewed you, but we obviously had to make choices to keep the film at a certain length that we would consider viewable by... Concision. Concision, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there, are, there are things that are not disclosed in a media, particularly in the United States. For example, that the BP settlement was not a fine. They didn't go to verdict with the judge. They actually settled out of courts, and, and therefore it has a large percentage of that, which is tax deductible. <laughs> But that's not reported because I would imagine that anyone who isn't even a self-identified environmentalist would find that in a grave injustice and then be catalyzed to action. Could you speak to what are the mechanisms that, that see, what are the processes? Because one of the things that we so enjoyed about making this film was that you lay out these best practices, you lay out these mechanisms and it demystifies that process. But how do you see now the media and the way that it is being directed the way that it is being moved so that we don't see the type of reporting on issues of prime concern to civil society that might allow us to be informed and take the action required? Uh, I don't think you can make a blanket comment on it. I mean, there's a lot of good material that comes out in the mainstream media. If you read carefully, you can learn a lot. In fact, one thing I learned a long time ago uh, in reading, say, the New York Times, is that the best way to start to read a front page story is to begin by looking at the last paragraph on the continuation page. That very often has interesting information. And I've never checked, but my guess is that good reporters understand that the first paragraph is what the headline writers are going to read and what the editors are going to read and what the people who care are going to read. But they want to tell you something that might be buried down there somewhere. So if you, if, you t if you take the mainstream media and read them carefully, you can learn quite a lot. But there are plenty of things that don't appear, like what you mentioned, what I mentioned, and so on. And you have to search to find them. Uh, it's not impossible. And uh, if we do, reach the kind of society that's described there of isolated individuals, you know, you and your iPhone, 
this was a couple of years ago, said you and your television set. But if the society consists of you and your iPhone, you're not going to learn these things. Uh, the way people learn is by interaction. Uh, that's even true of the advanced sciences. If you go to a research lab in the sciences, people are talking to each other. They're challenging each other. They're presenting ideas, getting reactions, uh, reactions from students, and so on. Uh, if you're isolated, you know, there may be an individual genius who can figure things out, but it's not likely. You don't have the resources or the support or the uh, uh, the encouragement to try to find out who you are, uh, what's happening in the world, uh, where, where you should be looking, and so on. So if in organized societies with functioning, significant organizations, like labor unions, which were a very educational force, not just fighting for workers' rights, workers' education was a major phenomenon in the uh, live, active unions, uh, that kind of political associations, others, uh, then you can learn where to look. You can, re you can encourage each other, you can inform each other, you can have your views challenged, uh, refine them, and so on. Then you can overcome the very natural efforts of uh, elite institutions to protect you from what they don't want you to know. Uh, so it's, uh, like everything else, a constant struggle against power. Thank you, Nathaniel. Good evening, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Chomsky. I'm uh, thrilled that you're here and I'm sort of having a lot of experiences. <laughs> um, I wanted to speak, uh, ask you a question specifically about U.S. support for Israel. Um, I've been and an active member of the local chapter of Rochester Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, and it seems like, you know, sort of as a nation, we're on the, there's a sort of dichotomy where on the one hand, um, U.S. support for Israel has gotten, has ramped up and has gotten more draconian. Um, but at the same time, there's also more, I think, grassroots resistance um, as well, so my question was regarding media coverage. What what can we take up advantage of um, in in media as political activists to educate um, the American public on the realities of the Israeli occupation of Palestine? Uh, well, first of all, let's let's take the phrase U.S. support for Israel. That's a pretty misleading phrase. Uh, does U.S. policy support the population of Israel? It supports U Israeli government policy, uh, but to call that support for Israel means presupposing that state policy is, help is designed and implemented for the benefit of the population. And I don't think it is. I think Israeli state policy for quite a long time, in fact you can kind of date it, has been very harmful to the interests of the people of Israel, let alone the Palestinians and others, Lebanese. Uh, if you could, and there's good reasons to believe this. Uh, one of the things that doesn't get reported. So I think if you look at the history of uh, uh, both U.S.-Israeli relations and Israeli policy, there was a very fateful decision made in 1971. You can find it if you do some research. It's not in the main books. Uh, in 1971, February 1971, uh, the president of Egypt, President Sadat, uh, offered Israel a complete peace treaty, full peace treaty, anything you want, uh, in return for Israeli withdrawal uh, from the occupied territories and in fact, he only meant the Egyptian Sinai. So in fact, in, in return for Israeli withdrawal from the Egyptian Sinai, Israel could have had full security. Okay, they had to make a decision. Do we want expansion or security? If the government cares about the welfare of the population, they would say, of course, we want security. They didn't. They said, we want expansion. 
expansion at that time meant driving tens of thousands of Bedouins out of their homes in Sinai, building settlements, uh, and a permanent state of war. In fact, the war came a couple of years later, pretty close call for Israel, because of the refusal to uh, accept the peace treaty. And in fact, it continues like that since. Policy is designed to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, in favor of expansion, illegal expansion, which is uh, highly coercive and destructive of Palestinian society, but also leaves Israel in a constant state of being embattled, constant. Uh, constant state of threat and uh, uh, internal moral disintegration, uh, sharp shift to the right, uh, very harmful effects on the society. Now that's not unusual. Uh, governments are not in business to uh, benefit their populations. Uh, U.S. policy is pretty much the same. Uh, if you take a look at, uh, take say the major threats that really uh, threaten the continued existence of an organized, uh, relatively civilized society. There are two of them. Nuclear war, global warming. Is the government uh, dealing with those threats? Yeah, by increasing them. And this has been going on for a long time. Uh, government policy is, is designed to implement state power and the power of dominant elements within the society. Here it means mainly the corporate sector. Uh, the uh, welfare of the population is secondary and often not cared for at all. Uh, and this is true of what's called U.S. support for Israel. Well, that's not your actual question, but I, I think that's uh, something. I'm sorry about the lack of concision. <laughs> this is the 10-minute lecture. But, <laughs> but that's, I think that's something in the background that always ought to be thought about. Now, as far as... Uh, U.S. support for Israeli state policy. Uh, that has many roots. Uh, some of the roots are simply uh, geostrategic, um, uh, since the, U the current U.S. policy towards Israel was pretty much uh, founded in its current form in 1967. W before that, it was kind of a mixed story. Uh, but uh, in 1967, uh, Israel performed a great service for the United States and for the uh, radical Islamic states that the United States supports. The United States typically has supported uh, radical Islamism in opposition to secular nationalism, just as Britain did before it, and for good reasons. So the most extreme radical Islamic state in the world is Saudi Arabia, our main ally. Uh, at that time, there was a conflict between radical Islam and secular nationalism in the Arab world, between Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and uh, Israel destroyed secular nationalism, supported radical Islam, uh, the oil dictatorships. Uh, U.S. aid to Israel shot up, uh, in, uh, and policy was really shifted to support for Israeli power, Israeli state action. 1970, uh, once again, Israel made a great contribution to U.S. power in the region. Uh, the uh, 1970 was, uh, uh, there was a Palestinian uh, uprising in Jordan, and Jordan's a U.S. ally, U.S.-British ally. Uh, it was uh, crushed by a Jordanian force, it's Black September. It looked for, a, and the U.S. was very much in favor of that, as was Israel. Uh, it looked for a moment as though Syria might become engaged to protect the Palestinian population who were being decimated in Jordan. U.S. didn't want that. But the U.S. was in no position to intervene. If you remember that time, spring of 1970, it was right after the invasion of Cambodia, the country was blowing up, the colleges were closed, people were you know, marching on Washington and so on. The U.S. couldn't get involved. So it requested Israel to mobilize its forces to threaten Syria to back off, and they did. And Black September went on. Uh, U.S. aid to Israel quadrupled that year. And so it continues. There's many, Israel has become a, a, what's called a strategic asset. 
performs many actions supportive of Israeli, of US power. So say under Reagan, uh, the US wanted, Reagan wanted very much to participate directly in what was virtual genocide in the uh, Guatemalan highlands. But Congress under popular pressure had restricted uh, US participation. So Reagan had to form a international terrorist force uh, to take over for him. Israel was in the forefront. They did the training of the Guatemalan officers. They provided the arms. Uh, until today, the Guatemalan army uh, uses Israeli arms and uses Israeli training. This kind of thing goes on all the time. Uh, that's one factor. But there are other factors. Uh, one reason, uh, one critical factor is uh, uh, the United States happens to be an unusually religious society. By international standards, uh, there are very few societies where there's as much religious extremism as in the United States. And a lot of the religious extremism is a version of evangelical Christianity, which is pretty much the base of the Republican Party, which happens to be both violently anti-Semitic and strongly in support of Israeli policy. Uh, if, if, if you look at the theology, you know, think of the theology, the idea is uh, we, should, we should work to create uh, Armageddon uh, when, you know, all kind of, everyone gets destroyed, uh, the saved souls rise to heaven, the Jews go to permanent damnation. You can't be more anti-Semitic than that. Yeah, even, even Hitler didn't call for that. Actually, uh, in some versions, uh, 160,000 Jews uh, convert, find Christ in time, and they're saved. The rest are gone. But that means supporting the harshest, most extreme Israeli policies, uh, maybe even trying to create a war between uh, Israel and the Arab states. Then we'll get you know, the battle, Armageddon, you know, the whole story and then uh, for saved souls. That's a big part of the American population. And in the Republican Party, it's a large part of the base. Now, there are other factors, too. Uh, they've never been studied, so this is kind of a speculation. Uh, but I can't, I can't give direct evidence for it, but you might think about it. If you look at support for Israeli state policy around the world, it's concentrated in the Anglophone countries the United States, Canada, and Australia. Now, what's special about those countries? Those are settler colonial societies, societies in which European settlers came and essentially wiped out the indigenous population. Now, what's Israel? It's a secular colonial society in which first European, later other uh, Jewish immigrants came in and they're essentially trying to get rid of the domestic population. You can't just massacre them anymore the way it was done in the 19th century, the way we did it. Uh, but uh, these are similar, I suspect, the suspicion that there's a kind of a cultural sympathy to redoing our history. And it's deeper than that because if you look at the early settlers in the United States and Canada and Australia, uh, they were religious fanatics. They were waving the holy book, saying we have to get rid of the Amalekites who are inhabiting the land, and uh, we're the new children of Israel, and so on. Uh, so there's a kind of a cultural continuity that uh, goes a long way. And in fact, Christian Zionism it goes back way before Jewish Zionism, and it's also an elite phenomenon. So, for example, when uh, Allenby conquered Jerusalem in uh, 1917, if you look at the headlines in the major press, it was, uh, you know, Richard the Lionheart at the Limerick finally gets rid of the, uh, you know, of the, 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 um, is, the Islamists who had conquered Jerusalem. We finally uh, won the Crusades. Uh, members of uh, President Roosevelt's cabinet, like Harold Ickes, one of his main advisors, uh, called the return of Jews to Israel, the, uh, what's, what was then Palestine, the greatest event in history. God's word is being fulfilled, you know. Uh, this is 
really a deep part of American culture and British culture and the Anglophone societies. And, uh, all, and there's also, a, there is a powerful lobby. My own view is its influence, while real, is kind of exaggerated, but it's there. And all of those are factors that kind of converge to yield support for Israeli state policy, which is quite different from support for Israel. But the point you mentioned is extremely important. There is a change going on, mainly among young people, but that is where changes usually start on most things. And uh, say on college campuses, uh, Palestinian rights are one of the main issues. That's a huge change from 10 or 15 years ago. I mean, I see it personally. I literally used to have police protection if I was even going to talk about Israel and Palestine, uh, even in my own university, others too. Now, there's absolutely nothing. You know, you can't get a hostile question. Uh, the, the hostile <laughs> questions are, why aren't you extreme enough? You know, but uh, <laughs> those are big changes, and they could lead to a change in U.S. policy. And I think there are things that people should work for. Simple changes uh, that I think Jewish Voice for Peace should work for. Uh, calling on the United States government to follow its own laws. I think that's a good place to start. Now, there are laws in, uh, I mean, uh, uh, put aside uh, international law, which people regard as something exotic, uh, but take U.S. law. The U.S. law explicitly bars military aid to any military groups that are engaged in systematic human rights violations. It's called the Lay Law. The amendment. That's U.S. law. Uh, major inst organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International uh, for years have been calling on the U.S. government to follow U.S. law and to end military aid to Israel. And we ought to be asking the same thing. At the very minimum, we should be asking that our government follow its own laws, and that would mean ending military aid. Now that would have an effect. Now that would be one part of a more general realignment of policy uh, which could lead the United States to basically join almost the rest of the world in calling for a political settlement. And that, that could have a big impact, I think. There's plenty that can be done. I think you begin. <laughs> I think you begin to get an idea of why it took us five years to make this film. It's good to be back. I suppose it's too much to hope for a hostile question for you, Professor Chomsky, but to the right. Uh, so speaking of speculation and redoing American history, um, the documentary kind of ends on this positive note when talking about activism but also cautions against sort of like that blind anger of people against people, yet that's something that we're constantly seeing and something that's really coloring all of the political climates that, whether it's bipartisan politics or just so, social politics. So that said, would you speculate that we're, we might be leaning closer to a political revolution or say something more violent like a second civil war, or would you say that we're pretty much doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing? Well, I, my, I mean, I think what we're seeing is pretty much what you describe. A lot of uh, hatred, uh, anger, uh, really irrational attitudes, uh, people mobilizing against their own interests, literally against their own interests, supporting uh, political figures whose goal is to harm them as much as possible. Uh, uh, we're seeing this right in front of us. You look at the television set, you see it every day. Where's it going to go? Uh, that's really up to you. Uh, it goes where people like you will direct it. Uh, we have plenty of opportunities to do things. It can be, uh, the, this th uh, film opened with a comment of mine about the uh, 1930s being objectively much worse than today, but subjectively much more hopeful. And there was a reason for that. People were working together. They weren't just hating each other. Uh, they were organizing the CIO. 
carrying out uh, sit-down strikes, fighting for civil rights, and so on, and doing it in unity, was breaking down uh, ethnic and uh, racial barriers. Well, that can, you know, we're not genetically different from the people in the 1930s. It can be done again, just as it was done then. And remember that at that time it was done after a period not unlike today, a period of very high inequality, uh, harsh repression, uh, destruction of the labor movement, uh, much poorer society than today, many more, many fewer opportunities, uh, we can pick up the same thing and turn uh, the de current developments in that direction. But it's got to be done. It's not going to be happened by itself. Professor Chomsky, um, my, my name is Jake. Um, I wanted to start by thanking you uh, for your timely response to the uh, email I sent you when I was 16 years old. Um, <laughs> it's very much appreciated. Um, uh, my question was a, a lot of the film dealt with um, the struggle between the forces of democracy and those that would seek to retail it. And, um, Many people might therefore find it surprising that you identify yourself as an anarchist. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, the intersection between those two principles, anarchism and democracy. Between anarchism and democracy. Well, uh, you know, anarchism is a term that's meant all kind of things over the years. But I think the core of anarchist principles is what was mentioned at the end of the film. Uh, any, and this comes straight out of the Enlightenment, uh, any, and classical liberalism, uh, any system of domination, hierarchy, oppression, uh, whatever it is, uh, from a family to international affairs, has a burden of proof, has to show that it's legitimate. If somebody's giving orders and somebody else is taking them, you have to have a justification for that. It's very rarely possible to give a justification. And if you can't give a justification, then that structure of authority should be dismantled, step towards greater freedom, greater justice. That's the core principle of anarchism, but that's democracy as well. If you take a look at, uh, say, John Dewey, who was quoted, you know, after all, the leading U.S. social philosopher, uh, you know, straight out of mainstream America, uh, what he was saying is exactly that. He didn't call himself an anarchist, but what he was saying is, as quoted there, that uh, until all of the institutions of society, uh, production, commerce, distribution, uh, information, media, schools, everything else, until they are all under popular democratic control by participants, then, in his phrase, politics will be the shadow cast by big business over society. That's a very reasonable comment, and it generalizes to other institutional structures. So that's democracy, that's our leading philosopher of democracy. It's also the basic principle of anarchism. And it comes straight out of the libertarian element of the Enlightenment and classical liberal thought. So I, I don't think they're in opposition in any respect. They're kind of two ways of looking at the same kind of problem. Uh, popular decision-making decision, decision -making in the hands of people who are concerned with the decisions and their impact. I Uh, Professor Chomsky, uh, given that uh, it's an election year, I'm sure you've probably been getting, uh, been getting variations on this question, uh, but with the New York primary having happened not too long ago and more people engaging with some of the ideas in your documentary uh, in conversation and actively and in public spaces than usual, I just wanted to ask you which uh, presidential candidate uh, do you feel most closely reflects your understanding of the uh, systemic changes and corrosion or perversion of American institutional life. And, uh, I'm sorry if that's, you know, too direct, 
Uh, but, um, and do you feel that that candidate has an actual chance of enacting uh, the critique if he or she gets elected? Well, I think an actual sincere question. Thank you. I think if uh, we took a poll of the audience, uh, we'd get about 100% uh, uh, agreement on what my answer would be on the candidate. So I, it's exactly who you think. But uh, does, uh, uh, does he have a chance of, be I'm kind of amazed by how much success he's had. And it's kind of striking that he's being described as a kind of a radical extremist. Actually, Sanders's views would not have surprised Dwight Eisenhower. He's a mainstream New Deal Democrat. Uh, Eisenhower, who was hardly a radical, uh, said that uh, anyone who doesn't accept New Deal policies doesn't belong in the American political system. Uh, that's Eisenhower. Uh, taxes on the wealthy were way higher and so on. Uh, Eisenhower is not my ideal by any means, but I'm just trying to point out that what Sanders is calling for is, first of all, pretty mainstream, not long back, but it's also strongly supported by public opinion. So take, say, his uh, call for national health care. I mean, there are plenty of polls in the United States on what people think about the health care system, and it's pretty remarkable that there's very high support, often substantial majority support, for a national health care system. In fact, right now, the latest poll I saw, it's about 60% of the population, uh, which is pretty remarkable because nobody speaks for it. It's constantly condemned, you know, it's some bad thing they have in Denmark or something like that, <laughs> but it's uh, not anti-American. But everyone's in favor, a large part of the population is in favor of it. Uh, when Obama uh, instituted the Affordable Care Act, as you may recall, there was originally talk about a public option, which means national health care. It was supported by about two-thirds of the population. It was dropped, no discussion. You go back earlier to the, uh, say, the late Reagan years, uh, about 70% of the population thought that national health care ought to be a constitutionally guaranteed right and in fact, about 40% of the population thought it already was a constitutionally guaranteed <laughs> right. Uh, the reason is when you ask people what's in the Constitution, what they say is anything decent, you know, who reads the Constitution. But if it's sensible, then it must be in the Constitution. So 40% of the population thought it was already there. 70% uh, of the population thought it ought to be there. And this is pretty consistent. And the same is true on other issues, like uh, raising taxes on the rich, uh, strongly supported, uh, even by you know, uh, Trump's, Trump backers uh, and others who pretty often have kind of social democratic attitudes when you look you know, down with the government, but more spending on education, uh, health, uh, uh, aid for uh, women with dependent children, not welfare. That was demonized. Welfare means, uh, you remember Ronald Reagan's tales, it means uh, some you know, black man g uh, going and stealing your money at the welfare state office. Nobody wants that. But you want what welfare does. People are in favor of that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Sanders, quite across the board, his views, his positions, are, have substantial, if not a majority, public support, and were pretty mainstream not long ago. What that means is the, the political spectrum has shifted so far to the right that what the population wants and what was once mainstream now looks radical and extremist. Well, it's up to us to shift it back. Uh, the Democrat, today's Democrats, are pretty much what used to be called moderate Republicans. Uh, you know, Rockefeller Republicans, that's the mainstream of the Democratic Party. Uh, the Republicans are just off the spectrum. They're not even a political party anymore. But, uh, uh, and, uh, but, but, but I am, I must say, pretty amazed by how far he's gotten. Uh, 
it's almost certain he's not going to win the election. But even if he did win the election by some miracle, he could do almost nothing unless there was mass popular support for the policies that he wanted to implement. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, you know, I mean, you know, uh, otherwise, nothing would go through the Congress, the bureaucracy, uh, anywhere else. So the core question is, can that mass popular mobilization be continued and extended and become a functioning force that'll beat back the regressive uh, tendencies that have created a pretty ugly s a situation in the country. Here, so could you actually, sorry, could you actually speak to, there was something that you had mentioned, the oligarchical nature in the United States is evidenced by the Princeton report that the I don't Princeton know, report. that people might not be familiar. Yeah. Well, there was a, public, uh, a study published by Princeton University, I guess about a year ago, uh, by um, Martin Gillens, who was mentioned, and Benjamin Page, who's a political scientist at Northwestern. Two of them are two of the leading uh, uh, students of uh, political scientists who study uh, popular opinion and policy. Uh, and a t study of the relation between popular opinion and policy is a kind of a major uh, component of academic political science. And it's a pretty straightforward thing to study. A policy you can see, a public opinion you know of from extensive polling. And the polling is pretty reliable, pretty consistent, gives you pretty good results over long periods. And this particular study by Gillens and Page uh, took, I think, about it was 1,700 or so uh, policy decisions and compared them with public attitudes and with uh, business uh, interests and you got the results you'd expect. They were uncorrelated with public attitudes and closely correlated with uh, a corporate interest, which is not particularly surprising because it's the corporate interests that write the policies. Uh, the funding for campaigns is not just uh, to, to get the candidate in. Uh, even if you're funding candidate, if, you're, if the people you're funding lose, uh, still funding buys access. Every, all the funders understand that. If you fund a candidate, uh, that candidate is going to give you privileged access because he wants, he or she wants the funding to continue. Privileged access means that your corporate lawyers that go to the staff of the legislator, uh, the people who actually write the legislation, the legislatures often don't even know what's in it, but the people who actually do the work, your corporate lawyers go and deluge them with uh, data, alleged data, you know, arguments, uh, tons of material, and they basically write the laws. So what comes out as policy is pretty much what's written by the corporate lob lobbyists and lawyers uh, who gain the access thanks to funding. So the fact that uh, policy doesn't correspond to public interest is, shouldn't be a big surprise. And it's uh, similar to the, uh, 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 what was quoted in the film, the study by Martin Gillens, a book called uh, Affluence and Influence, in which he showed pretty convincingly that uh, for 70, about 70% 70 of the population, that means the lowest 70% on the income wealth scale, there was essentially no correlation between their attitudes and the, uh, uh, what their, their own representatives were doing. They were just uncorrelated, which means that that part of the population is essentially disenfranchised. And it's not just 70%. That means as you move up the income wealth scale, you get s slowly, slightly greater correlations, but not very high. It's only when you get to the very top, and that means beyond the level of what the census data can give you, probably a tenth of a percent or so, standard guess, it basically policy is set. So of course you're going to get results like the Princeton result which was a pretty dramatic one. It's worth looking up on the internet. Thank you. I want to give the father of one of our directors the opportunity to ask a question. Sia, down, down, the gentleman on the right. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you for uh, joining us, Professor Chomsky. I'm curious how you prepared for the film sessions. Did you outline notes, chapters, was a stream of consciousness? How did you prepare for the film? For the interviews, how did you prepare for the interviews? How did I prepare for the interviews? Well, to tell you the truth, I, I'm not sure I was aware that the interviews were going to turn into a film. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, I, if I was, I've forgotten. I mean, I have, uh, I mean, uh, my surprise. Wife, uh, 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 my wife can tell you, when I go to work, I have several hours of interviews every day. And uh, they kind of all, you know, kind of meld in my memory. <laughs> That's why we only came up every six months to clandestinely. <laughs> so they may have sprung it on me. I'm not sure. <laughs> Bev knew. Uh, Bev was in on that. Oh, she was in on it. Yes. Bev is Professor Chomsky's assistant at uh, MIT. Yeah. Michael. Yeah. So I actually wanted to address this to the directors, um, and maybe Professor Chomsky can call it on. Um, I thought it was a perfect film. Very powerful. A little closer, closer Mike. Yeah. A little closer. A little closer. closer. Better. Okay. Um, I hope a lot of people see the film, and I think one possible criticism, which I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts about, um, is the possibility that it places too much faith in the power of human rationality. Um, I think much of what the film seems to chronicle is this process of decline of rationality in the public sphere, decline of democracy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in drawing that very well of visuals, Professor Chomsky's perfect embodiment of the virtues of rationality see very well and very powerfully. But given that the masters of mankind have gotten so good at preying on our irrationality, um, they've gotten so good at perfecting the means and the instruments for keeping people in this condition where they're choosing to act in irrational ways. I think in particular with our advertising, consumption, uh, the mainstream media, etc., etc. What are what are the chances really that any of these trends are going to be reversed? If all that is so powerful, it not seems to make out. Well, if you think about it, the uh, the advertising industry which spends uh, hundreds of millions of dollars a year to create, uh, uh, to, uh, to cr create the kind of individual who's focused on uh, uh, fulfilling artificial, uh, externally imposed wants and who are making, uh, who are uninformed consumers making irrational decisions. The reason they're spending huge funds on that is because they think people are rational. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother. Uh, they're trying to turn people into irrational creatures. And they're putting huge efforts into it. Uh, uh, and I think they're right. They're not wasting their money. If they didn't do that, people would be making rational decisions. And I think the rational decisions would be essentially uh, dismantling uh, illegitimate author authority and hierarchic institutions. You think and in fact, that people are fundamentally Pardon? Rational? You think that there's evidence that yeah. beings are fundamentally rational? Well, I agree with the advertising industry. I think they probably are. And in fact, if you look over history, there, there is plenty of progress. Uh, even in uh, my lifetime, last generation, it's a very different society. Uh, you wouldn't have had uh, 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 events like this or films like this uh, 50 years ago. It was in, inconceivable. Uh, if, uh, you wouldn't have had a mixture of, a mixture of people like this uh, 50, uh, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. It's changing. Uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot more uh, freedom, uh, uh, not economic equality, but other kinds of equality that have been gained through popular struggle. Uh, it takes a, well, let me just describe my own university, but it generalizes across the country, in fact, and part across the world. Uh, when I got to MIT in the 1950s, uh, it was uh, white males, well-dressed, jackets and ties, quiet, doing their homework, 
no activism, obedient, no passive. Uh, now it's like uh, Rochester. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh, though I wasn't at Rochester 50 years ago, I bet it was the same. That was the picture across the country, and it's changed. So it's now, like other places, about half women, third minorities, uh, informal relations among people, uh, a lot of interaction, uh, plenty of activism of all kinds. Uh, these are big changes in the society. In fact, uh, just take a look at the presidential campaign. Uh, it was mentioned that the major issues that we face, like climate change and uh, nuclear war, those just aren't discussed. But there are things that are discussed, like uh, my wife and I passed a television set in the hotel this morning, and the big issue that was being discussed was a battle between Trump and Cruz about uh, what bathrooms people are allowed to go to. Now that is being discussed. <laughs> and uh, there is a background of that in uh, the rise of equality and people's rights. I mean, kind of makes the campaign look ludicrous, but there's a serious <laughs> issue behind it. Mm -hmm. Would you like to take one more question? Yeah, we don't have time for one more. Okay, with apologies I'd actually, for those I'd love to here. add from the filmmaker side, I think one of the things that we enjoyed so much about coming back to Chomsky, Professor Chomsky time and time again, was the fact that there was always a through line of the tremendous victories that have been won by social movements that you would come back to time and time again, pointing out that in our collective national storytelling that we often don't think of those victories, but that nobody would consider it even within the realm of possibilities that we would go home on segregated public transportation or that my sister couldn't vote or that my mother couldn't vote. So we've had tremendous victories, but what you, I think, pointed out so well in the film is that those only came from the organization of social movements that sacrificed, organized, and fought together, banded together in unity and solidarity to create those rights. And that we now live in an era of tremendous freedom secured by those who did that before us and that there's no real reason that we can't do so again. And also that I think on the heels of that, that there's a cyclical, nature, uh, cyclical na nature to that. You know, that there's been different periods in time in our history where there have been real vibrant, robust uprisings, activism, and that, you know, it's really up to us and everyone in this room to take a look back at our history and say what happened in the 30s, what happened in the 60s. You know, some people would argue that what's happening with the Sanders campaign is another potential variation of that, that it's a starting point for, for further gains to be made depending on what, you know, what Bernie does with, with this, you know, with this groundswell of, of public opinion that, have, you know, that he's created. Um, and I think that's been a really valuable thing for us to see, that there's a perspective there. We have to know our history. We have to, we have to see that it's up to us because it is a cyclical thing. A last question from this side. Uh, thank you, Professor Chomsky. Um, given the financialization of the economy and also the offshoring of manufacturing, um, not having like a a large industrial proletariat in the United States anymore. Uh, where do you see the strategic areas where working class can leverage power uh, in the 21st century? Well, first of all, it's uh, not a law of nature that uh, the United States doesn't have a manufacturing industry. In fact, it could, and we're constantly seeing cases where if there was enough popular mobilization and activism, we would have a productive manufacturing industry manufacturing the right things. I'll mention one striking case that I happen to have brought up a couple times in the last couple days, so you may have heard me say it, but it's a very striking example, I think. Uh, after the last, if the housing bubble crashed and the financial crash, uh, as you remember, the uh, government pretty much took over the auto industry. It was in government hands, that means popular hands. That meant there were choices that the public could have made if there were an organized, active public 
there were choices that people like us could have made about what to do with the auto industry. Well, unfortunately, there wasn't that active mobilization and organization. So what was done was the natural thing that uh, benefits the powerful. Uh, the oil, uh, the industry was pretty much a taxpayer expense uh, returned to essentially the same owners. Some different faces, but the same banks, the same institutions, and so on. And it went on producing what it had been producing, uh, automobiles. The alternative would have been turn it over to the workforce and have it produce what we need, which is not more cars on the street, but efficient mass transportation for lots of reasons, uh, for our own benefit, for the benefit of our grandchildren, if they're going to have a world to survive in. It's not going to be through automobiles. It's going to be through efficient forms of transportation. Plenty, that's, there's plenty of work to do there. The United States is way behind other countries in efficient mass transportation. And it could be done by the workforce, skilled workforce uh, in that industry. Uh, retooling it wouldn't have been that expensive. And it would be beneficial to them, beneficial to us, beneficial to the future. That was a possibility. And things like that are happening all the time, constantly. That was a very big one, but there are small ones happening. So there's no reason why there can't be a major